Well, hello, everybody, uh, and welcome to our presentation on the CDC's NEARS program, which is the National Environmental Assessment Reporting System. My name is Elizabeth Nutt, and I am the Food Safety Director for AFTO and the Project Manager for the Retail Food Safety Association Collaborative Cooperative Agreement. Quite a mouthful. It's my pleasure to facilitate today's webinar. Uh, I am joined today by my associate, Mr. Vince Radke. Vince is formerly with CDC, and he is also an advisor for AFTO with the Retail Collaborative Grant. Vince will be taking down, there's Vince, yes. Vince will be taking down any questions you submit in the Q&A box. I think you'll see at the bottom of your, your screen that there's a little Q&A box. So if you have any questions, please submit them there and we will be um, addressing those questions at the end of the presentation. Uh, also, we have Ms. Amy Bonzel. She is our program coordinator with APTO, and she'll be assisting us today with um, our technology and our slides. So a bit of housekeeping before we begin the presentation. Uh, all in attendees are in listen-only mode. Uh, this webinar is being recorded, and we will be sending out a link um, to the future for the future reference to the um, web to the recording we do intend to have time at the end of the presentation for questions so as i mentioned earlier please submit those in the q a box and we'll do our best to get to those questions that, as time permits so next slide amy so at this time i'd like to introduce our guest speakers we have dr laura brown who is the team lead for the National Center for Environmental Health with CDC. We have Ms. Nicole Heaton, who is the senior epidemiologist for the Minnesota Department of Health. Mr. Danny Ripley is the environmental health specialist with the Tennessee Department of Health. Ms. Lauren Dupree is the senior environmental health specialist with the Southern Nevada Health District. And we have also Ms. Laura Wildey, she is the Senior Program Analyst for Food Safety with the National Environmental Health Association. And Laura also works on the Retail Collaborative Grant representing NEHA. So with that, um, if everybody's ready, I will begin with Dr. Brown. Dr. Brown? And Amy, you can go to the CDC presentation. Hi, um, thank you. I'm just gonna jump right in. As you see from this slide, I am with CDC's National Center for Environmental Health. There are a lot of centers at CDC, and this is one of them. And within that, I am with the Division of Environmental Health Science and Practice. Uh, next slide, please. So our division is focused on supporting environmental health specialists. Um, and in particular, we're focused on supporting them in their foodborne outbreak investigation efforts. Um, so we want to support outbreak environmental assessments at the state and local level, and we want to collect and analyze those data at the national level. Next slide. So what do I mean when I say environmental assessment? Um, that's the terminology we use um, to describe the environmental health component of an investigation. So if you think about the triangle, um, epidemiology focuses on identifying the sick people and, and their symptoms. Uh, laboratory focus on identifying the pathogen that is causing uh, the illness, and then environmental health is focused on um, understanding how the environment contributed to um, the outbreak. How did the agent get to the host? Next slide. Um, ideally, environmental assessments, they, they encompass a variety of um, activities, and they focus on finding the environmental causes of outbreaks. So again, they describe how the environment contributed to the pathogen reaching the host. Um, and some of the activities they might involve, again, depending on the outbreak, are interviewing kitchen managers and food workers about the restaurant's policies and practices, about food handling, about the workers, um, observing how restaurants prepare food, in particular um, food that might be implicated in an outbreak, um, reviewing um, records, for example, temperature logs, um, traceback records, those kinds of things. Um, and then they can also involve sampling uh, for pathogens in the, in the kitchen environment. Next slide. Um, so one of the primary focuses, foci of an environmental assessment is identifying outbreak contributing factors. Um, about 25, 30 years ago, CDC and FDA looked at outbreak data and grouped 
factors that contribute to outbreaks into these three broad categories, contamination, proliferation, and survival. Um, so um, contributing factors that contribute to contamination of food with a pathogen fall into the contamination category. And an obvious example might be an ill worker preparing food. They contaminate the food with the pathogen that's making them sick. Proliferation, um, you leave food out at room temperature for a couple of hours and a tiny bit of pathogen in that food is allowed to proliferate to a large enough amount that can make people sick. And then survival, um, for example, Ground beef, raw ground beef that's contaminated with E. coli does not get cooked to a hot enough temperature to um, kill the pathogen. So this is really important information to know about the cause of an outbreak. If we know this, then we can know how to think about preventing outbreaks in the future. Next slide. Um, environmental assessments can also focus on um, the antecedents to the contributing factors. So, so the contributing factors tell us what happened um, and then the environmental antecedents help us think about how and why those things happened. Um, we haven't collected data in a systematic way on these things, but um, we've theorized that there's sort of five major categories of antecedents. So people, processes, equipment, food, and economics. Um, and honestly, the best way I think to, to talk about this is to do an example. So we'll move on to the next slide. And this is actually um, a real life outbreak based on a Minnesota outbreak. So if you have detailed questions, you can ask um, our next speaker about them. Um, but there was an outbreak, um, 36 cases, 36 ill people, ill with salmonella were identified. Um, and the um, epi investigation implicated dinner rolls as, as the food that was associated with those illnesses. So this is really critical information to know about an outbreak. We need to know the pathogen. We need to know how many people are sick. We, we need to kind of know the food that was involved. Um, so we learned this information from the epi and lab activities. Um, and next slide. Um, and now we want to know how the heck did cooked dinner rolls get contaminated with uh, salmonella. So the environmental health specialist took the information they learned from the epi and the lab um, activities. Um, and went into the restaurant to do an environmental assessment. So they interviewed food workers and they observed food preparation practices. And then what they learned was that the same set of brushes were used to brush butter on the raw chicken and then also to brush butter on the cooked rolls that were served directly after the butter was brushed onto them. So this tells us the contributing factor, which is uh, cross-contamination from the raw chicken to the cooked rolls. So this is something we, really important. Now that we know what happened, we can work to start preventing it. Um, it also helps us, um, uh, they also collected data on the, on the environmental antecedent to those contributing factors. So um, they learned that the process was that in between these two different activities, the brushes should be washed and sanitized to prevent cross-contamination. Clearly, something went wrong with that process. And so we can think about how do we prevent this from happening in the future? We need to do something about this process. Um, next slide. So this information was really helpful to the environmental health specialist at that moment with that outbreak. Um, they helped the restaurant come up with a solution to this problem. They brought two different sets of brushes that were different colors so they could make sure that they wouldn't mix them up again and contaminate from raw to ready to eat food. And then they trained the workers on that process. Um, so that helped with that immediate outbreak. It probably prevented um, future illnesses. So what we'd like to do at CDC with NEARS is take all of that information about um, the environmental causes of outbreaks that are collected uh, you know, all around the country, um, aggregate those data, and then um, apply what we've learned from those data to prevention of outbreaks at sort of the larger level. Can, what can we learn from these data that can help us improve food safety training programs that might help us improve food safety regulations, for example? Next slide. So um, that is how NEARS was born. Um, we, in 2014, we, we um, released NEARS and it's designed to collect data from state and local outbreak environmental assessments. So states and localities who participate first take each CDC's training on how to conduct environmental assessments. And then they actually conduct outbreak environmental assessments when they do outbreak investigations and they report the data to NEARS. So we have 51 registered participants so far, um, states and locals, with over 1,000 outbreaks reported to the system. Next slide. Um, so 
just a quick sell to you on the benefits of NEARS participation. I hope I've sold you on the first primary benefit, which is that it should help you solve your outbreaks um, at the local level, help you identify the causes of those outbreaks and, and help the establishment um, implement interventions to prevent that kind of outbreak from happening in the future. Um, but there are some other benefits. You get an annual report from CDC every year summarizing your NEARS data, and this can help you with your FDA standard five requirements. Um, you can collaborate and communicate with other NEARS states and localities. Um, we usually have an annual meeting every year that, that is um, funded by CDC. We Obviously, we're not doing that in COVID, but our participants tell us they really like the, the ability to talk to other people, other investigators about investigations at those meetings. If you are interested, you can collaborate with CDC on our analyses of NEARS data. And then our system is built in such a way that you can document and track your system's foodborne outbreak response data. So it can help you evaluate um, your program's activities in a So oh, Amy, it looks like Dr. Brown froze up a bit. Um, it, it does, yes. Dr. Brown, are you still with us? Oh, there she is. Oh, she left us. Okay. And then long term. Oh, there we go. Um, uh, next slide. Sorry, I don't know what happened. <laughs> can you hear me now? Yes, we can hear you now. Yep, and we can see you again too. Okay. Okay, sorry about that. Um, so here you see real quick, um, this is a snapshot of one of our annual reports that we provide to our sites. Um, and it just provides you with um, a lot of data about the outbreaks that have happened in your system in the past year. So you'll see contributing factors, for example, the top contributing factors to the outbreaks in your system. Um, there's also some data to help you evaluate um, your program's activities. For example, the average number of visits to complete an environmental assessment. Um, next slide. And then finally, um, so thinking about the big picture, um, we do think the more programs that we have conducting these environmental assessments and reporting the data to two NEARS, we can long-term contribute to improved outbreak investigation and prevention. Um, so we've already started analyzing NEARS data and we've learned some things. Um, I'll just cover one of these because I know we're short on time. Um, we looked at all the norovirus outbreaks reported into our system. And we found that restaurants that had cleaning policies and used gloves and trained their staff in food safety and had certified managers had significantly smaller outbreaks than restaurants that didn't have those things. Um, so we find this to be really um, significant information. It really helps us think about prevention and control of, of outbreaks going forward. Next slide. Um, so just to summarize, um, we do think NEARS um, will help you improve the identification of environmental causes of foodborne outbreaks. And eventually these data, these activities will lead to improved outbreak prevention and intervention. And I will stop there. Um, so Elizabeth, I think we're just going straight on to the next speaker, right? Yes, Ms. Nicole uh, Heaton will okay. be presenting next, thank you. Yeah, so Nicole Heaton from the Minnesota um, Department of Public Health is our next presenter. Hello, everyone. All right. So Laura touched on a lot of the benefits, but I'm going to give a little bit of a Minnesota specific spin on some of them. Um, so I am the SNET or the um, NEARS coordinator and SNET coordinator um, for Minnesota. Um, so we are an SNET site and we have been participating in NEARS pretty much since its beginning. Um, and so we, we really have had a lot of benefits for participating in NEARS. So I'm gonna just kind of touch briefly on a few of those. Um, so next slide. All right, so um, in Minnesota, we uh, are centralized when it comes to outbreak response, um, but we do have our state kind of split up into both state and local jurisdictions. So the Department of Health has 30 delegation agreements that cover 37 counties and nine cities within Minnesota. Um, and then the Minnesota Department of Health has seven district offices kind of all scattered. They're noted by stars on the map throughout the um, state. 
and we cover 52 counties, one city. So the local jurisdiction is in the dark blue and the Department of Health jurisdiction is in um, the light blue. So we're lucky that we're a centralized state, um, but you'll see kind of on the next slide that you can really tailor the NEARS program um, to best fit how it will work for you. So if you wanna advance to the next slide. So when it comes to NEARS data collection, like I said, you can make it work, um, whatever will work logistically for your program. Um, so some sites I know have their inspectors do the NEARS data collection. Uh, for us, because we're a centralized uh, system when it comes to outbreak response, we actually have four data collectors um, for NEARS and we've divided the state pretty much up into four areas. All of us have been trained, we've taken the EATS training, um, and then two of us actually do the data entry part. Um, we tried to keep kind of the number of um, bodies doing data entry limited just so we don't have errors and we're all on the same page. Um, and we do collect in both local and Department of Health jurisdiction. Um, so like I said, you can really tailor it to what is gonna work for your program. So next slide. Um, when it comes to NEARS collections, uh, on average, I'd say we have about 20, um, 25 that we do a year. Um, so we get those entered, closed out by the end of the year. Obviously some years we have more outbreaks, some years we have less. Next slide. Okay, and you can advance one. So besides just the challenges of, you know, needing time and bodies to actually collect and enter the data, um, the benefits have really been extensive for us. Um, like I said, we've been participating um, in NEARS kind of before it was even NEARS for about the next or the last 10 years, um, but the communication has been a huge benefit. Um, so improved communication between our epidemiologists and our environmental health department. Uh, we now have um, bi-weekly meetings where I sit in on those with the epidemiologists. I can get updates on what's going on in the outbreak world. We have a lot of co-trainings, co-presentations together. Um, we even have like a outbreak spreadsheet for tracking that I can review and access. Um, so that that benefit of participating in NEARS has really just um, made it more of a team effort between EPI and EH when it comes to outbreak response. Next. And then of course, you know, there's the environmental assessment piece. Um, it's, it's become much more of a standardized process. Um, we do a lot of trainings now based on some of the NEARS tools, uh, the, the NEARS um, manager interview tool. There's a lot of really great questions on employee illness that we probably wouldn't have considered. Um, questions like, as a manager, do you actually ask an employee what their um, symptoms are if they call in sick? Um, so we, we've centered our or tailored our trainings for inspectors around a lot of these questions um, so we can focus in and make our environmental assessments much more standardized. Um, and many of you are probably are already doing environmental assessments when it comes to outbreak spot response, so why not enter it into NEARS? And next. Okay, and then uh, I'm gonna touch on this a little more in the next slide, but Laura mentioned that you do get an annual summary um, that kind of, you know, provides a really great visual resource um, as to what outbreaks occurred in your site and um, contributing factors. And it really helps us kind of dedicate efforts and resources by having that visual to show um, management and also operators, inspectors. Um, and even we've had our inspecting supervisors provide it to local public health departments, cities and counties, um, so they can kind of keep on the pulse of what's going on outbreak wise in our state. Next. And then like Laura said, our ultimate goal is, you know, identifying contributing factors to foodborne illness and identifying the environmental antecedents and really working towards outbreak prevention. So we've had a number of publications that have come from the NEARS data that have been extremely beneficial. Um, and I think, you know, everyone wants to prevent out outbreaks. So this has been a huge, um, huge benefit. Next slide. Okay, so I'm just gonna focus a little more on the annual summary. So this is our 2018 summary report for Minnesota. Um, so like I said, it, it's such a great visual resource. Um, it's easy to follow. Um, we share this often with operators at different trainings um, and you know, it outlines our outbreaks that occur, but it also goes into some of the establishment characteristics, like are they independent first chain establishment, um, things you might not really look at when it comes to outbreaks. Um, and it, it's been a really valuable resource. Next slide. 
And then looking at it a little closer for 2018, um, you know, we can look at our outbreak primary agents and it's a nice pie graph to identify, okay, we've had about 11% of our outbreaks have been due to Campylobacter. And then if we look at our food vehicles, we have about 10% are due to poultry. Um, and I will say uh, the past few years and in 2018, we had um, Campylobacter infections associated with chicken liver pate on the rise. Um, so this just, again, is a great visual to, you know, identify, oh, we might need some training for inspectors here. We might want to do some educational outreach to operators um, because we are having these issues. I think I have a little picture of some chicken liver pate if you want to click next. There you go, that guilty culprit there. Okay, and next slide. And so what we've done, you know, with, with these resources and then we've, um, these data summaries have helped us drive um, resource needs. So we've created a Campylobacter environmental health checklist to respond to these uh, chicken liver pate outbreaks. And it really has helped our EH focus on, okay, when you're doing the environmental assessment, really focus on the food flow of the pate, final cook temperatures, temperature logs, you know, any cross-contamination potential and hand hygiene. Um, so this just shows and you know, how we can use all that summary data from NEARS, not only to, you know, contribute to outbreak prevention on a national level, but also for our own state, um, how we can drive resources where we want to put our time and efforts and maybe trainings um, to help prevent outbreaks. Next slide. And so that's all I have, um, but I definitely encourage you to get involved. Like I said, you probably are doing environmental assessments maybe in your state, so why not um, enter them? And feel free to reach out at any time if you have any questions. I'm more than happy to um, help you out. Thanks. Oh, and now I'm going to turn it over to Danny Ripley with um, Department of Health and our in Tennessee. All right. Thank you, Nicole. Hi, everyone. My name is Danny Ripley. I'm with the Tennessee Department of Health, and I'm going to share with you how we incorporate NEARS within our foodborne outbreak response. Next slide, please. So Tennessee has a population of about 7 million. We have a centralized food regulation based off the 2009 FDA food code, which is, in, uh, which is enforced by both the Tennessee Department of Agriculture and Tennessee Department of Health. Now, within the Tennessee Department of Health, we have about 170 environmental health specialists. We issue a, a, approximately uh, 28,000 to, uh, to 29,000 food permits across the state. Uh, our outbreak investigations employ uh, the three disciplines of, of the typical outbreak team, which is laboratory, environmental, and uh, epidemiological uh, folks. And then we also participate in the CDC SNET. And, we've, and like Minnesota, we've been part of the SNET essentially since its inception. So we've been able to, to be a part of the process of the NEARS development from its beginning. Next slide, please. So in, in Tennessee, we have eight regions that are state governed. We have five contract counties. And what's important to note here is that the, that the five contract counties enforce the same regulations in terms of food safety. They also partner with the state during outbreak investigations. And these five counties, as well as all the regions, collect NEARS data. Next slide, please. In terms of reporting NEARS uh, outbreaks into the system, we average about 12 to 13 uh, outbreaks per year. And of course, this past year has been really slow because of the COVID pandemic. But nonetheless, it's usually anywhere from 12 to, to 15 outbreak confirmed foodborne outbreaks that are reported into, into NEARS across the state annually. Next slide, please. So there's some challenges with foodborne outbreak investigations. And these apply really to anyone out there doing outbreak investigations. It's not unique to Tennessee. But I want to address some of these challenges and how we feel like that NEARS helps address some of these challenges. And those are in communication, um, environmental health specialist experience, and logistics. Next slide, please. So in terms of communication, often there's a little bit of a, a disconnect uh, uh, shortly after the outbreak occurs with environmental health, meaning there's high to, to medium to high engagement uh, and, and environmental activity at the beginning of these outbreaks. But as the outbreak continues, and depending on the type and nature of the outbreak, often environmental health specialists are kind of on the back burner or not influencing uh, actions that are taking place. And, what, and, and some of this is expected, but it's important that environmentalists are part of the process of providing that information, especially during reporting. 
uh, and making sure that what's observed in the field is accurately described in those reports. Next slide, please. And there's also an experience factor. Uh, if you, as you can see here across the 13 regions in Tennessee, some of these regions experienced very few confirmed foodborne outbreaks uh, over the past six years here of this data. So what that says is of those 170 environmental health specialists, many of them really are not getting a lot of experience uh, in actual foodborne outbreak investigations. Next slide, please. And then of course, Tennessee is a, is a rather broad state. It takes about eight to 10 hours to drive from the Northeast uh, Tennessee to the Southwest part of Tennessee. And across the state, we have several public health labs, but the lab in Nashville, Davidson County does the lion's share of foodborne outbreak work in terms of sample, uh, environmental sample testing um, or food sample testing or uh, pathogen typing. So it's often necessary that supplies or samples or things need to go to, to, uh, to Nashville from other regions and presents somewhat of a logistic uh, challenge. Next slide, please. So one way that we address these challenges with logistics and experience is that we've identified persons responsible for taking leads in outbreak investigations. Now this is from the, from the environmental perspective, of course. We have 13 primary investigators representing each region, and we also have support for those folks. We have secondary investigators as well. And then we also have a couple of folks, myself and, and DJ Irving, that provide support from, uh, from the SNAP. Next slide, please. So each of these folks, we ask that they, that they participate in the CDC's training, and we also provide face-to-face -face training uh, for each of these, in, these individuals assigned for taking lead responsibilities uh, within outbreak investigations. Next slide, please. All right, and so back to uh, the, the SNET support, as I mentioned, DJ Irving uh, is out of Nashville or, or Middle Tennessee. He supports folks from Middle Tennessee West, and then I support folks uh, in terms of outbreak response, environmental assessment um, from East Tennessee to Northeast Tennessee. Next slide, please. And some of the things that we provide in terms of this support is it, it could be field support. Where we're actually going into the field and helping uh, assist in environmental assessments or collecting data, collecting samples, moving samples from one point to another. Uh, we also provide a liaison with lab and epi with environmental. Uh, we, we help with data quality in terms of the NEARS data quality, the, the actual um, collection of data, but also the data entry into the system. And then, of course, we promote and train NEARS throughout this entire process. So these are some of the fundamental ways that we are supporting uh, folks across the state with each uh, specific outbreak that we, uh, that we identify. Next slide. So these are some questions. These next four slides are some questions that we've filled in the past, and they might be questions that you have to field. And this is how we've responded to these questions. So one of the questions is, um, you know, at, at first glance, it might appear that the instrument is rather lengthy and, and it's going to take a lot of time, um, but it's actually not. And, and one of the things that we do when we communicate this to the environmentalists that are responsible for collecting the data is to understand that there's several several different sections and many of those sections will be completed at different intervals throughout the investigation so it all doesn't have to be collected at once uh, and there's also some 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 um, shortcuts that are available uh, that we print and we try to have available to the to the folks in their in their outbreak investigation kit so that they can get out into the field and collect this data more efficiently and more quickly um, and then we also, as I mentioned earlier, it's very important that we provide this level of field support for NEARS data collection, as well as uh, data entry support. In many instances, we may go out and do the interviews and, and help with the observation. In many instances, the, the environmentalist who's been trained to do that may collect that data and get it back to us, and we may enter it into the system. We just try to provide any level of support that we can in that manner. Next slide, please. So another concern is, okay, how many visits is this going to require? And we all know that when, in an outbreak investigation, normally environmentalists are going out to the locations more than once to get all the information, especially depending on um, if, if it's a complex outbreak as new information comes in and so forth. But one thing we try to do and try to encourage is that having those quick sheets for observation and manager interview, having those quick sheets ready, if we, are, if we see something come across the board that might be a cluster, it's not an outbreak yet, we're going to look into it, it might have some promise in terms of it being an outbreak, but go ahead and ask folks to, to collect the data on the very first site visit. And, and what that does is it gets the data closer to the event, which is helpful, obviously, 
Um, but it's also the data that we're collecting through manager interview and observation. Much of this information we're going to be collecting during our environmental assessment anyway. So it's really not that much more work. And it can prevent or reduce the amount of times that we have to go back out to the location for NEARS data collection. So capturing that information on the very front end can be very helpful. So those isolated complaints or clusters that we're investigating that look like they could lead into an outbreak, we're trying to encourage folks to go ahead and capture that data at the very onset. Next slide, please. And then, of course, there's uh, it, will this data help solve the outbreak? And I think, and, and Dr. Laura mentioned some of the 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 the, the, the proponents of uh, or the advantages of using NEARS and how NEARS is designed to help us understand better understand the uh, environmental antecedents and the contributing factors in these outbreaks. So yes, it can contribute to a better understanding of what happened there. And it's also, as I mentioned earlier, a lot of the questions that we're asking are the same questions we would be asking uh, if we were doing a routine environmental assessment. Now, I'm gonna pause there and say that an environmental assessment has other aspects as well. We might be doing food flows, we might be recreating events. Uh, so there's other things and activities that take place in an environmental assessment. Uh, but the, the data that we do capture in uh, our NEARS data can help prompt us to be looking at specific things, especially in the manager interview, looking at policy and procedure. It might cause us to look in a different area and help us better understand uh, the outbreak. Next slide. So how will this improve our overall plan? So we've kind of laid it out here a little bit. Uh, if we incorporate NEARS as we've done, uh, it's enhancing our training. We're requiring folks to go through this higher level of training for outbreak response. Uh, and then we also provide this level of support. Now the support's for NEARS, but it's also supporting our routine environmental assessments. Uh, so that allows us to, in our view, have more effective environmental assessments uh, in the field during outbreak investigations. And it also contributes to collaboration and communication among all the stakeholder, stakeholders uh, with, uh, within our outbreak team. And as a result of that, we feel like we're getting more accurate contributing factor reporting, ensuring that what we're seeing in the field is accurate and that is also being translated into these uh, reports, or national reports that are often created. And then finally, the information um, that Nicole mentioned about as far as the, the benefits moving forward, uh, we, we, we can use the, the, the data that we have to help influence how we do routine inspections, what the emphasis is or what the training should be to our environmentalists, and also what kind of emphasis or, or emphasis shifts that we might have with the training that we provide to operators. Uh, we use the um, uh, NEARS as part of uh, meeting our, our FDA program standard number five. So that's a, that's a value as well. And then it's the greater picture of, of public health and the information that we capture uh, in each one of these outbreak investigations, how that's being used across the country to better understand uh, the characteristics that are associated with restaurants that are involved in foodborne outbreaks. Next slide. So this last slide has no words. Uh, it's it's kind of uh, it's just an image that we that that we feel like describes NEARS and how NEARS as incorporated into our system. NEARS is like that thread that really kind of weaves through a lot of the th systems and processes that occur during an outbreak investigation, uh, from the training to the communication, to the, the, uh, the identification of contributing factors and the root causes or the, the environmental antecedents of those, those causes, to how that information is disseminated within our organization and how that information influences our organization as well as influences uh, other organizations across the country. So we really feel like that NEARS provides uh, this, this um, uh, the, the, the support and it strengthens the things that we're already doing. Um, so that's, um, I think that's my last slide. With that, I just have a few acknowledgements and there's DJ's uh, email there and as my email as well, and just extend the invitation to folks. If you have questions or something we can help out with, by all means, reach out to us. And at this time, I'm going to turn it over to Lauren Dupree. She's with the Southern Nevada Health District, and she'll take over from here. Thanks, Danny. So my name is Lauren Dupree. I am a senior environmental health specialist at the Southern Nevada Health District. And I wanted to kind of show you all the before and after from when we implemented NEARS and how it's changed our program. Next slide, please. 
so a little bit about us. We are a local health department. Um, we are in Las Vegas, Nevada. We're responsible for the large cities, Las Vegas and Henderson, as well as some of the outlying rural towns um, around the outskirts. And in that, we have over 2 million residents. That accounts for about three quarters of the state's population. And on a normal day, in a normal year, we usually have some millions of tourists on top of that at any given time. Um, in order to regulate that, we have about 52 food inspectors, and they're responsible for doing the routine restaurant inspections for about 21,000 food permits. Next slide, please. So I just wanted to give you kind of this comparison here, and I want to be clear, near didn't dictate for us what we needed to change. They didn't have like a checklist for us, make sure you have X, Y, and Z going on. Um, <clears throat> really what it did, we knew that we wanted to make some upgrades to our foodborne illness response program. Um, and NEARS provided us a way to think critically about what we had already, about what we wanted to prioritize, and it kind of helped us navigate these changes. So these are more inspired by NEARS in some cases. So uh, for example, our training. Before, we would just have one of our senior investigators um, show the junior investigator what's going on. They would go out and do some peer shadowing. Usually, they'd go out on one environmental assessment, and then that new junior staff member would be released to conduct them on their own. Um, now, after NEARS, we have a more formalized training system. It begins with that um, EAT system from CDC, which hopefully will be back online soon. That's an excellent training, um, the EATS training. After that, there's a classroom PowerPoint presentation that I do that kind of um, is more specialized to SNHD, showing our staff how we take these NEARS principles and enact them here. And then we do that observation portion, and then they are able to conduct environmental assessments. Um, before NEARS, we had four staff members trained up to do these environmental assessments, and they did not work in food full time. Uh, they were part of our special programs unit, so they had a little bit of a catch all. And we knew that we really wanted to beef this up, so we shifted the program a bit. And now all of the investigators do work in food full time so that they're more uh, familiar with the intricacies of the food regs and it's more on the, um, the front of their plate. And now we have 10 staff members who are trained up and able to respond to an, um, an outbreak. And our policies, like I said, um, were informal for training. So it was similar with the policies. It was really just handed down from the senior in investigator to the junior investigator. We did have some policies written down, but they were already outdated, kind of referencing older systems, folks that no longer were involved in the program. Um, now we've updated everything, formalized everything, and we're really quite proud of our new outbreak response guide that we've developed that takes the process from the moment the, the complaint comes through the district to the moment that it's published, the outbreak report is published, and everywhere in between. So it's designed that if we have a new supervisor or a new investigator and on their first day there's an outbreak, they can open up this guide and know what's expected of them at every part of the, every step of the way. And then as far as how we would schedule our response to an outbreak, Originally, um, there would be two individuals assigned to respond, and then they would get together and see where their schedules align, and then that's when they would go out. Sometimes that would be a few days in the future. Now, granted, these are, these are small. These are maybe two-person two outbreaks, more clusters, really. Um, but still, we knew when we were making these changes in years that we, that we wanted to be um, a little bit more, more quick to respond. So what we've done now that's been working really well for us is we've created an outbreak response calendar. So each day has an investigator assigned to it. So when it's their day, they know to keep it flexible. So if anything comes through, we can um, reach out to them. They'll be able to respond that same day. They know um, that they know to keep it flexible. It keeps us more agile and we can respond more quickly. Next slide, please. And then um, the other presenters have talked about communication. NEARS is really great for um, helping with that and kind of reemphasizing the importance of that. So before our three departments would meet as needed during outbreaks to check in. And even though our buildings were about five minutes apart, we never traveled that great distance. It would often be via conference call, um, which we know is not ideal. 
And then our EH investigators uh, didn't have an opportunity to meet just themselves to kind of talk about what's going on in the field. Um, now, after implementing NEARS, we have um, reinstated our routine FIT meetings for our foodborne illness investigation team that has all three departments meeting in normal times in person, which has really helped bolster those relationships between the departments. Um, also, we've developed meetings that are routine for our EH investigators to get together, talk about what they're seeing in the field, what questions they have, weird things that they that they notice, um, uh, how they're filling out the forms, things like that. So it's really helped bolster discussion there. Um, as far as the investigation forms go, we did a complete overhaul. One, we found that our existing forms weren't really setting our investigators up for success. They had, um, there were mostly a series of open text boxes with very vague guidance for what should go into each box. And so we found a lot of variance between investigators on what, what was being reported. Um, also, when implementing NEARS, we knew we needed to collect distinct individual um, data. So uh, we reworked our forms to collect that data um, and make sure that we had everything that would be ready, that we would need on a, on a NEARS upload. So now after NEARS, we have completely new forms that really guide our inspector through the process. And it's, it's keeping contributing factors at the forefront. So as they're working through the environmental assessment, um, we're thinking about contributing factors all along the way. And it's kind of leading us to uh, deciding which ones make the most sense. Um, as far as the annual reports, uh, our other presenters have talked a lot about this as well. Before, we would just do a visual review of our spreadsheet that had our responses on it. Now we have that great annual summary that's basically an infographic. That's been such a great tool for us to share our program successes and what we've been doing every year. Um, and then also data sharing. So before, our environmental health data from these assessments, these investigations was staying in-house. Now we're really proud to be sharing it um, and, and being a part of these future analyses about outbreaks. Next slide, please. So basically all of this is to just kind of share with you how we were able to use NEARS as a guide as we revamped our program. We knew we had some changes to make. We had the ability to prioritize it at the time. And NEARS really helped us think critically about um, what we wanted our program to look like on the other side of it. Um, and it's been quite useful for us. And on top of that, the, the NEARS community has been really great. We've had some great discussions and, and brainstorming, and it's, it's really great to be able to call up or email um, some of the other NEARS members and ask about a specific outbreak or ask about how they would handle a certain situation. Um, it's been great for stealing ideas and, and inspiration, and we continue to improve our program based on these relationships that we've formed within NEARS. So it's been a very valuable tool for us. Um, with that, I will go ahead and turn it over to Laura Wilby from NEHA to talk a little bit more specifics for you. Great, thank you so very much. And um, it, great presentations by my fellow panelists thus far. They've really shared some compelling information about getting involved in NEARS and the benefits. And now you might be thinking, well, this seems like a really great program. If only there were some funds available for my jurisdiction to learn more. So I'm here to tell you that there is funding available and I'd like to get into the details of that on the next slide, if you could. So in conjunction with the CDC, NEHA is offering sub-awards between $2,000 and $4,000, depending on the number of applicants we get, to support state, tribal, local, or territorial governmental food safety programs in their quest to learn more about NEARS. So the funding supports staff time to learn about NEARS, which could include taking the environmental assessment training, participating in the three NEARS webinar training sessions, attending regional national NEARS presentations. And it also can support purchasing environmental sampling and investigation equipment. So those that are eligible are state, tribal, local, and territorial governmental food safety agencies that are not yet participating in NEARS. 
And if we go to the next slide, I'll show you where to apply. If you click this bit.ly link, you'll be brought to a NEHA site where you can apply. It is a 30 minute or less application. It's very easy. Um, you can just go in and fill out this form. The application will get sent directly to me and we will review it to make sure that you meet the eligibility requirements. And the deadline for that is 5 p.m. Eastern on Friday, March 12th. Uh, the awardees will be notified via email after the ap application period closes. So you still do have some time to submit an application. I really encourage you to go to the webpage and sign up and um, hopefully we'll see you on the other side. If you go to the next slide, there is my contact information. You can email me with any questions that you might have. I'm happy to answer any of them. And I believe um, that is the end of my presentation and we'll go on to the next round. Thank you. Well, thank you uh, to all of our uh, speakers. Uh, just a just a wonderful job today. Thank you very much. I, I do want to let all of our speakers know, as well as the participants know, that we did have some international participation today. So I think not only has it gone nationally, but it's gone globally. So uh, very good. So let me start off uh, with the first question, and it's going to go to uh, Nicole from uh, Minnesota. Nicole, what is the size of outbreaks for which NEARS assessment is collected in Minnesota? So it's not necessarily based on outbreak size that we collect. Um, it's more if it's a confirmed foodborne outbreak is when we collect NEARS data. So if it's, for example, a norovirus outbreak or it's looking to be norovirus, um, we would collect on that. Um, salmonella outbreak, it's, it's more... Um, based on what the pathogen is and not necessarily the number of cases we call a confirmed outbreak um, if there's at least two cases. Um, so that, that's when we would collect NEARS. So not necessarily size, but um, pretty much any outbreaks that you would do an environmental assessment for in a restaurant. Thank you, Nicole, appreciate that. Don't go away, Nicole, one further question that's for good. you. Is the EH checklist on the Minnesota Department of Health website, uh, what does it look like as a great resource? And also, can we get a, uh, are there, are these checklists available online? Yep, we actually have them available on our, um, Minnesota is a, a food safety centers of excellence. Um, so it's on our COE website and I can make sure that link goes out. Um, but we have multiple different checklists we've created. It's not just for the Campylobacter ones. We have norovirus ones, salmonella ones um, that really help kind of drive that environmental assessment component for the um, inspectors when they go out. So I can make sure that link um, gets to Elizabeth um, and we can send that out. Wonderful, wonderful. Uh, this next question, um, it can go either to Danny or Dr. Brown. I'll start with Dr. Brown. Uh, can people get a copy of the instrument? Yeah, they can. We don't have it on the CDC website, but you can certainly email me and we can um, share a copy with you. Danny, did you want to add anything to that at all? Oh, you're muted, I think. Danny, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. No, I don't have anything to add. We we just uh, download the uh, copies of the uh, instrument and make copies and, and supply those to our staff as needed. Okay, well, Danny, don't go away. I have an additional question for you. Can a state only effectively use NEARS if all jurisdictions within the state are using NEARS? So, so can I, can I, yeah, so, a, so, let me put it another yeah, way. Can, yeah, can a yeah, state, yeah, can a state use NEARS if all the jurisdictions within the state are not using NEARS? Yeah, I think, I think that's probably a better question for, for Dr. Brown, but I, I would say yes. And I think there's evidence of that happening uh, within uh, um, the other folks on this call, for, in fact. So, um, in Tennessee, fortunately, we've we've got everyone on board with collecting data. But if uh, you know if there was a 
a county that did not want to collect data, we would still be moving forward with our nearest data collection. So uh, in Tennessee, we would, and I suspect other states would uh, would follow suit. All right, great. Laura? Yeah, yeah, just, um, just to follow up on that, obviously there's a lot of variability in how um, environmental health and food safety programs work across states and counties. Ideally, every county and every state would be doing NEARS, um, and that's certainly what we encourage, but we do have jurisdictions that are doing NEARS and their state isn't, and in some cases the state is and the jurisdictions isn't. So we do our best to work, to work with the situation that we've got. Okay. Do any of our other speakers wish to add uh, anything to what Danny and Laura have said? Okay. Let me move on to uh, Lauren. Um, question for you, Lauren. In fact, I have a couple of questions for you. So the first one is, uh, does your uh, EPI staff ever accompany your EH staff in the field for an outbreak investigation and assessment? So that has happened before, usually for our um, larger outbreaks. Um, it's, it's rare, but for example, we had a large Noro outbreak at one of our major casinos on the Strip, um, and it impacted food establishments as well as the, the property as a whole. So in those situations, we did do a walkthrough with hotel management, um, EH staff and EPI staff, just to get kind of, it was more... It was less of a restaurant environmental assessment and more of a, okay, this is happening. This is a big deal. We need to know who everybody is, who are our points of contact, who's responsible for what. We're going to be in contact for the next couple of weeks and just kind of setting the ground rules there. Um, so, yeah, we have had EPI involvement in the field. Often when we have new EPI staff members join the foodborne illness team, we would take them on a, a ride along to um, – go to just a regular routine inspection so they're familiar with the kitchen environment and some of the things that we talk about in our EH report. Great, Lauren. Thank you very much. Um, Elizabeth, I'm going to uh, give you the job of cutting me off with the questions here when, when time approaches. But um, well, We have so, time probably for one more, Vince. Okay, so one more. And this goes to uh, Laura Brown, to Dr. Brown to start with, and then we can open it up to the other uh, speakers. Uh, Dr. Brown, has anyone seen a decrease in outbreaks after NEARS? So that is a good question. And I think this question is referring to the fact that, that we hope that the information that we learn from NEARS will eventually lead us to, um, to outbreak prevention. Um, and I would say we haven't really looked at the data in that way yet. We're just now getting to the point where we have enough outbreaks to start thinking about analyses like that. I think it's a really good question and it's on our list. Sorry for Great. that non-answer, but that's where we are. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, to our participants, I, I'm sorry I couldn't get to all your questions. Some excellent questions uh, came in, but we just don't have the time uh, to get to them. I'm going to turn it over to my colleague, Elizabeth Nutt, and she'll give you some instructions, uh, you know, for the speaker and participants, how we can get some of those questions answered. Elizabeth. Thank you, Vince. Uh, as you can see, there's the contact information uh, that was on the screen there. I hope you had an opportunity to record that if you have additional questions, but this was a lot of information in a short amount of time. Uh, Amy has posted in the link to uh, look into the NEARS uh, program and the and the uh, funding opportunity through NEHA. So I hope you'll you'll uh, look into that. Um, also, uh, I just want to thank all the uh, presenters for for their wonderful information. Again, it was a lot of information, just kind of a bird's eye view of it all. But I I will strongly encourage you to consider applying for this great opportunity to advance. Uh, foodborne illness outbreak investigations. Uh, I hope many of you have the opportunity to join the NEARS program and contribute to this beneficial project. So again, uh, thank all the all of you for attending. I want to thank our wonderful speakers, and I hope you all have a great rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.